Our lesson on 6.2 is going to cover evaluating, classifying, and graphing polynomial functions. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, at the top of your notes, you're going to notice a little chart that describes for you uh, the degree of a certain polynomial, and then the name of that particular degree polynomial, and then what standard form of that polynomial looks like. Now, probably the most important thing on this chart is for you to understand the degree and then the corresponding name for that polynomial. So if it has a degree of 0, it's a constant function. If it has a degree of 1, it's a linear function. If it has a degree of 2, it's a quadratic. A degree of 3 is a cubic. Now, many of these you've heard already. Probably you've never heard of quartic or quintic. And you'll notice after quintic, which is a degree of 5, they kind of stop naming them, so they just start saying it's a polynomial with degree 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. So first thing is I'm going to give you a chart, and it has an equation in it, and I want you to write the equation in standard form. Now standard form for a polynomial just means that you want to have it in decreasing exponential order. So the only thing we're going to change here in this first function is the negative 3x to the fourth has the biggest exponent, so that term is going to come first, followed by the 1 half x squared, and then the minus 7. The degree of any polynomial is the highest exponent in the polynomial. So in our case, the degree is the highest exponent, which is a 4. If you don't remember what a degree of 4 is called, go up to your chart. A degree of 4 is called a quartic. And then the lead coefficient would be the number or the coefficient that is in front of the first term once it's written in standard form. So for our polynomial, when he was in standard form, his lead coefficient was a negative 3. Same idea here on number 2. It says write it in standard form. Well, if I look at the way it was originally written, it is in standard form. So I'm just going to kind of draw an arrow because I'm too lazy to rewrite it. The degree would be the highest exponent, and the highest exponent in this poly is a 3. So he's a degree of 3, which is called a cubic polynomial. And his lead coefficient was a 2 because that was the number in front of the first term. Number three, if I want to rewrite that in standard form, I'm going to put the 2x to the fifth in the first position because that's the highest exponent, followed by a plus 6x squared, followed by a plus x. Now the highest exponent was a 5, and if I go up to my chart, a degree of 5 was called a quintic. And then the lead coefficient, once I rewrote it in standard form, was a 2. Now the next polynomial is kind of strange just because he's got some really weird coefficients. Um, to rewrite him in standard form, the first term I'm going to write down is pi x squared followed by negative 0.5x followed by minus square root of 2. His degree is a 2 because that's the biggest exponent, which means this is a quadratic. Whoops, that's a quadratic. And then his lead coefficient, instead of being a whole number like we typically see, his lead coefficient this time was a pi, which is extra weird. All right, moving on. Direct substitution is the way most people choose to evaluate functions. So if I gave you a function f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 5x minus 7 and asked you to evaluate it at x equals 3, the first thing I need you to realize is this is a notation for evaluation or for substitution. It means take your function f and plug in a 3 everywhere you see an x. And you'll notice that's what they did. So if I went ahead and did that on my calculator, um, and it wouldn't be that difficult to do, the only thing I have to be careful about is in some problems it is very, very important that you remember your parentheses. Now in this case it doesn't really matter, but if I go ahead and type that in my calculator I get a 98. Now I'll show you another way to evaluate later on, but um, 98 is the answer no matter how, which way you do it. So for number 6, my function is a 3x minus 5, and they want me to evaluate this at x equals negative 4. So we're going to evaluate it by substituting in the negative 4 for the x. And you'll notice I always put parentheses around my x term. So let's see, that gives me negative 12 minus, 7, minus 5, which is negative 17. When I get to number 7, here's my function and then I want to evaluate it at x equals 1. So it's 3, absolute value bar. I'm not going to put a parenthesis here because there's really nothing 
that would help me to, by putting a parenthesis. Now remember, when you evaluate absolute value functions, you have to evaluate their inside parts first. So 1 minus 2 is a negative 1. Now think about the absolute value of a negative 1 is really a positive 1. So this is really 3 times a positive 1, which is how we get our answer of 3. And then be very careful that you use parentheses when you're evaluating number 8. I have to use a negative 2 for all my x's. So right here in particular, when I do negative 2 squared, if you don't use parentheses around the negative 2, you're going to get the wrong answer. So I'm going to go ahead and try typing that on my calculator. Or if you want to use your head, that's fine. It comes out to an 11. Now I'm going to show you another method to do that last problem, and it has to do with my calculator. It's called the storing function on my calculator. So I'm going to pull up my calculator, and in the home screen, I'm going to show you how to store. So, clear that out. For that last problem, remember they wanted the x to be a negative 2. So I'm going to tell my calculator that I'm going to store negative 2 for an x. So I type a negative 2, and then I hit this store button, which is on the left-hand side, and then x. And once I hit enter, now my calculator thinks that all the x's I type in the home screen are really negative 2's. So at this point, I can just go ahead and type in the original problem for number 8. Whoops. Hello. Oh, quit out of there. So I can type in 4x squared plus 2x, and then it was minus 1. Now the benefit to using the storing function is you don't have to worry about the extra parentheses because it understands that negative 2 is a quantity. So once I do that, I get my answer of 11. So sometimes on the ACT in particular, you don't want to think too hard. Using your technology can be really helpful. So don't forget about using the storing function. All right, back to our presentation. Back to our next problem. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. So end behavior. The end behavior of a polynomial is what happens as your polynomial approaches negative and positive inf infinity. So essentially what I'm asking you is, if you look far to the left and far to the right, what is your function doing? And this is the template for end behavior. It's always going to look like this. And the only thing you have to decide is whether your function is going to positive or negative infinity on these two parts. So first thing I want you to do is think about number 7. If I was to graph number 7, I'm just going to draw a little sketch. He would look, you know, he's a line. So something like this. So the end behavior is asking what happens to the left and to the right. And remember, end behavior starts the exact same way. So f of x approaches something as x approaches negative infinity. Well, let's look. As x approaches negative infinity, that means we're traveling to the left. So your function, as it goes to the left, is going down, down, down forever. And that's why I'm going to put a negative infinity right here in this position because as I travel to the left, my function is going down. Now for the other part of the end behavior, f of x approaches something as x approaches positive infinity. This is asking me what happens as I travel to the right. So my function as it travels to the right is going up, up, up forever, and that's why I'm going to put a positive infinity, or just you can write infinity, in that line. Okay, our next example is, if I graphed it, you probably already know what it looks like. It's an upside down parabola. So this time, when they ask me about end behavior, and they ask me about what happens as it travels to the left, well, my function is actually going down again when it goes to the left, so it's a negative infinity as the x approaches negative infinity. But as my function travels to the right this time, my function is still, whoops, that's positive infinity, my function is still going down, so it's still traveling to negative infinity. So it turns out the end behavior for this function was going to negative infinity in both directions. Now for number 9, if I tried graphing that, and maybe if you're not sure what it looks like, I'm going to draw it up here. Um, it's a cubic graph that's been flipped, so it looks, you know, something like this. I'm not totally sure what it looks like, but something like that. And you could always graph this on your calculator. So when I look at the left behavior, he seems to be going up. So my function is approaching positive infinity as x approaches negative infinity. So as I go to the left, my function goes up. And then if I look to the right, <clears throat> my function is approaching negative infinity. It's going down. Whoops. Don't need a comma there. 
negative infinity as x approaches positive infinity. So the first part of end behavior says what's happening to the left. The second part of end behavior says what's happening to the right. Now domain and range is a similar concept. You still kind of look at the ends, um, but we do need to kind of sketch a graph here. So x squared plus 3. You have to be a little more accurate when you're graphing this. This is a parabola who's been shifted up 3. So he looks something like this. And when I think about domain for this function, it's asking what happens as you travel from the left to the right. Well, this function goes forever left and forever right. So his domain would be all reals, which we describe as negative infinity to infinity. Now his range is low to high. Now he doesn't go any lower than the y value of 3. So I'm going to say that he starts at 3 for range, which a bracket should be used here but then he goes up forever so we need to call that infinity and remember from chapter two uh, infinities always have parentheses on their <clears throat> domains and range okay the next function we're gonna have to graph a little more accurately than I normally would because I'm gonna need to find um, the minimum value and when I go ahead and I try to graph this on my calculator <laughs> Go to y equals, type in 2x to the fourth, plus 3x to the third, and then plus 1, oops, not minus, but plus. Sorry, try that again, plus 1. Now I can tell that the domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity again, but for my range, I'm going to need to find that low point, and remember that's called a minimum. So I'm going to go to second trace on my calculator, and I'm going to choose what's called the minimum finder. And I can see he's right here, so when they ask me to go left bound and right bound, I'm going to go left and right of that point right there. So I'm going to travel a little bit to the left of him, once I'm there hit enter a little bit to the right, enter, and then enter one last time. And I see my minimum, not a pretty point, but that's okay. So back to my graph, we've got a minimum, whoops, <laughs> we've got a minimum at the point negative 1.12, negative 0.07. Now that's really all I'm kind of interested in when I'm graphing this, because everything else is just kind of, I'm going to fudge it. <laughs> so it looks something like this. So his domain was still negative infinity to infinity, with parentheses on both of those. But his range, remember, low to high. Now be careful. We want the y value for range. So his lowest y value was negative 0 0.07. You're going to have to round. And then he goes up forever, so he's going to go up to infinity. So it might take a little bit of technology work in order to find the actual high or low point for, uh, dom for range, not usually for domain. Now when I graph the next function on my calculator, he ends up looking something like this, which I don't know if you can tell but for my graph, but if you graph it on your calculator, you can see that he kind of goes everywhere. So domain and range on a function like this is very easy. Domain is negative infinity to infinity and he goes forever to the bottom and forever to the top. So his range is also negative infinity to infinity. So you kind of hope for functions like that. That would make life really easy. That concludes our lesson on 6.2.